Hi everyone, welcome to the All In for Ostomy Town Hall. It's the Hollister Incorporated uh, kickoff to recognize World Ostomy Day, which will be on October 6th. I'm Jill Danswitz, the Consumer Marketing Manager for the U.S. Ostomy Team. Since 1993, World Ostomy Day is celebrated every three years. The aim is to bring the needs and aspirations of the ostomy community to the forefront. We are proud to stand with the broader ostomy community to show how we are all in for ostomy. From social media to educational webinars to uh, runs across the country, there are so, there's so much that is happening and there are so many ways to get involved. These activities increase awareness and education and support for people living with and caring for ostomies, which includes healthcare professionals, family, and friends. Today, our panel of experts will discuss life with an ostomy and what inspires them to brace, embrace every day with confidence. It gives me great pleasure to hand it over to our moderator, Karen Spencer, who will lead today's discussion. Thanks, Jill. So, so welcome, everyone, to World Ostomy Day and Hollister's celebration. World Ostomy Day is all about bringing attention and awareness um, to the global community about people's desires, their awareness, and, and their passion about living life with an ostomy. My name is Karen Spencer, and I am the Director of Global Clinical Education, and it's my honor to be here today to moderate the panel. Um, today, as I said, World Ostomy Day is all about speaking out, because speaking out changes lives. And today's panel is going to speak out. They're also going to bring awareness to the global community, and they are going to help change lives. So welcome to our panel. I would like to introduce the panel today. Ryan Vor Van Voris. Mm -hmm. um, so Ryan has, very, um, has so many life experiences to share with us today. Ryan is a mental health director, and he worked at the Isaac Ray Center, which specializes in correctional mental health inside the Cook County Juvenile Temporary Detention Center. But it is with this education and these experiences that he also volunteers at Camp Oasis. This is a camp and a program that enriches the lives of children with ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease and provides them with a safe and a supportive camp community. It truly is a family for them. Ryan now runs a private dining and catering business that specializes in both incorporating and substituting menu items and ingredients um, for a variety of anti-inflammatory diets. The company is Nude Dude Food. <laughs> <laughs> and what Nude Dude Food stands for is it's really about the purity of the food that they prepare. Welcome, Ryan. Thank you, Dave. Thanks. I'd like to introduce Lois Fink as well. Lois is an internationally renowned inspirational speaker who entwines humor with her story, courage, strength, and determination. She has written a memoir entitled Courage Takes Guts, Lessons Learned from the Last Colon. Her passion is to bring awareness to the community about living with an ostomy. She regularly speaks to nurses, to physicians, to medical students, and the public about her experiences. Lois has appeared in various newspapers as well as US News, World Report, Ostomy Canada, and she even shared her story on TV with Sally Jesse Raphael. <laughs> so welcome, Lois. Thank you. And I'd now like to introduce Chris Sperry. Chris is a businessman and an athlete. Chris spent much of his career with Granger, where he served as Vice President and Global Chain Process and Systems. He's more recently become the founding partner of Hurdle Barriers. And this is a company that is truly dedicated to helping people face ser facing serious medical issues maintain and return back to a healthy lifestyle. Hurdle Barriers owns Stealth Belt, a manufacturer of support belts. And beyond work, though, Chris has a passion for swimming, for running, and for biking. And Chris is a finisher of the Wisconsin Ironman Triathlon. Welcome. Thank you. 
So I'd really like to thank, thank Chris and, and Lois and Ryan for participating today. And what today is, is really to tell their stories about living with an ostomy. Um, so one thing that I'd like to do just before we get started is give them the opportunity to share their story and what brings them here today to Hollister. So could you, each of you, um, provide us with a brief summary of your journey that resulted in ostomy surgery? And maybe I'll start with you, Ryan. Sure. Um, I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease in high school um, when I was 14, 15. Doctors really didn't know what it was, and so I had a hard time um, kind of just getting symptoms under control. They put me on a lot of steroids, a lot of different things. Um, so high school wasn't the best because they were just trying to figure things out. It wasn't until college. Uh, I, I spent a really exciting spring break at the Mayo Clinic. Uh, <laughs> but it was at that time where they had done some more extensive tests and realized that uh, my colon was to the point, it was diseased to the point that it had to be removed. There was nothing that they could do to save it, reverse it. Uh, so I had my, my colon uh, removed after uh, my junior year of college and had a permanent ostomy installed. And it, it really it changed my life for the better. Uh, at the time, it was, it was something that uh, was kind of hard to accept, but I didn't have any quality of life at the time. I, during college, I was in the bathroom 15, 20 times a day, you know, and that kind of ran my life. Um, so not having the choice as a, a 19 year old, you know, it was like, well, I, I, I want to have a quality of life. I want to live a long, healthy life. Uh, so it was uh, one of the best like non-decisions. I didn't, you know, I didn't have, I didn't have a choice at the same time, but uh, it, it, it saved my life. It changed my life forever for the better. Uh, I'm more active today. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with just your, your attitude also. I think for so much of my younger years, I wasn't who I wanted to be because of energy and, and symptoms and, and finally having the surgery. Um, it, it, I was finally able to be the person who I wanted to be. And so I've kind of dedicated much of my free time and, and career to kind of giving back and living life to the fullest. And it, it really, it, it's been a blessing in disguise. I, like you said, I, I volunteer at Camp Oasis. Uh, this was my 10th year this year. I was a counselor for five years. And then because of my mental health background, I transitioned to the mental health director. Um, and it's just like a, it's a summer camp. If anyone's ever been to a summer camp, it's exactly that. It's up in uh, near Lake Geneva on a lake. Um, except the, the cool thing is everyone has Crohn's or colitis. So that's kind of just out, out there and you don't have to be scared to talk about symptoms or poop jokes or farts. Or, <laughs> and it's really, it, it's, it's funny. Uh, and as adults, it's, it's a great kind of sense of community. But really, it's the thing I really love about it is for these kids. These kids, um, whether they have an ostomy or not, they, to, to see like the resilience in them and see these kids you know, living a normal life. And for them, this is maybe the one time of a year that they're surrounded by peers that have this. They don't have to be fearful of being um, made fun of or, you know, having to run to the bathroom. So uh, that is one of the things that I love about, you know, that came about because of my Crohn's and ostomy is able to kind of go back and give back every year. Um, now with my new career cooking, uh, it's, it's been great to work with clients. I'm a private chef. I'll come to your home uh, and cook a five, six course meal for various events, whether it's a bachelorette party, birthday party, wine night, whatever it is, corporate event. But we do a lot of um, anti-inflammatory diets, whether you have uh, Crohn's or colitis or any diagnosable disease, uh, food affects our guts and how we feel. And so we do a lot of uh, custom designing menus based on every person's kind of dietary restrictions and allergies and concerns. So it's been nice uh, in now my professional career to take my kind of personal background and experience and kind of bring it to the forefront and educate people um, not only about a healthy lifestyle but also making healthy food choices. Oh, thanks, Ryan, for sharing your story. Um, I think what touches me most as I listen to that story is I asked ask Ryan, tell me your story. His story was very short. It was all about everything he's done for everyone else thereafter. That's what World Ostomy Day is all about, and that's what bringing awareness to living and supporting this community is all about. So thank you. Sure. Lois. <laughs> 
Prince of Lois, can I get you to share your story with us? Of course. Uh, my story is similar to, to Ryan's. I was a teenager and I was always sick. The doctor would come to the house. They made house calls in the 60s. <laughs> ooh, ooh, wow. And um, I was diagnosed with a, a stomach virus, and I was given phenobarbital for the pain. And this kept you know, happening uh, week after week, month after month. And the diagnoses ranged from there was nothing wrong with me to I had growing pains. Uh, or else I was making all of my symptoms up. I was a nervous child who was a great candidate for colitis. Finally, in my senior year of high school, I collapsed and I was rushed to the hospital with what we thought was to be an emergency appendectomy. The next morning, I woke up on the children's uh, floor of a hospital in Pittsburgh, in walks a gastroenterologist and says to me, you have Crohn's disease. I, what? I battled Crohn's disease uh, for actually a total of 19 years. I had my first bowel resection at 17. Uh, I had a good year of, one good year of health. The disease returned. Slowly but surely, the disease went into the colon. And I had another bowel resection probably 10 years later. And really, as the disease progressed and affected more of my colon, I was running to the bathroom all the time, and I really had no quality of life. I experienced bowel incontinence relatively early on, and that was very difficult to deal with. Finally, after battling Crohn's disease for basically 17 years, my doctor, we talked about ostomy surgery, and I told him, oh, no way. I spent the next two years fighting the inevitable, I had to get to the point where I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. I was living my life in a bathroom. And the bathroom really became both my prison and my refuge. And finally, I realized this is not living. I made the decision to have ostomy surgery after a colonoscopy uh, where the doctor said, well, Lois, the last time you had this procedure, you had this many strictures in your colon. He said, now you've got double. The handwriting's on the wall. I made the decision to have ostomy surgery. I have never looked back. It has been the most freeing experience. The, the freedom that I felt was incredible. I was no longer defined by Crohn's disease. And now I feel I had the help of two people who were incredible. They were my role models. I thought if they could do it, I could do it. And I decided to speak out and let people know that they didn't have to be afraid of ostomy surgery. And that's what my passion is, that, you know what, I just go to the bathroom a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. oh, no big deal. And it really has made a tremendous difference in my life. Thanks, Lois. I love how Lois said she's not defined by her disease. And you're going to hear that as we continue on today, is it that all of you are not defined by your disease. They're not defined by having an ostomy. They're defined by who they are and what they do. And I'm going to get to ask them a lot of questions. And I know there's tons of questions out there, but I'll lead it. And I will open it up to discussion a little bit later. And finally, Chris, would you sure. be able to share your story with yep. us? Yep. Um, so I was 50 years old. I guess my journey is a little shorter happened in a little uh, shorter time frame. Um, was healthy, no history of cancer in my family at all, and uh, at uh, 50 began to have some small symptoms, a little blood in my stool, um, but at the time was training hard for a, an event where I was running 15 miles in the summer heat and doing 100 mile bike rides. And so I uh, went to see my doctor and said, hey, I have these couple of symptoms. I'm, you know, should I be concerned about it? And uh, he said, you really shouldn't. It's probably related to the activities that you're doing and doesn't seem like anything to be too concerned about. But uh, you've just turned 50. If you, if you want to have your colonoscopy now, you could, you could do that or you can wait. And uh, I said, well, I think I'll, uh, I think I'll wait because uh, I was in the middle of training for something. And as fate would have it, a couple of weeks later, I, I broke my elbow in a bike uh, accident and uh, not a very skilled bike rider. And, uh, <laughs> so it turned out to be pretty lucky because I thought, well, as long as I'm kind of on the shelf here and, you know, have some time off, um, I'll just go ahead and do the colonoscopy. So 
I did that, and uh, I remember the the doctor afterwards came and you know kind of said, "Hey, you know, there's some things that we found. It's going to take a few days to do the biopsies, but uh, you know they're kind of kind of concerning." So a few days later at work, the phone rang. Uh, the nurse says, uh, "Hey, doctor, so and so wants to speak with you." And I thought, "Yes," because everybody who's seen that movie knows they never deliver bad news over the phone. They always ask you to come in to the, to the office so they can tell you in person. But uh, my, my doctor had not seen any of those movies. <laughs> uh, so he was like, hey, I got some bad news for you. And uh, so that was uh, started a kind of a quick process to go, like Ryan, I went up to the Mayo Clinic uh, because I had a couple of tumors that were in, you know, difficult, uh, difficult places. And uh, my doctor here said, you know, if I were you, I'd go somewhere where they've seen a little bit more of this. Um, went through a lot of testing there. Um, ultimately, they came up with a treatment plan. Uh, but uh, there was a very good um, uh, radiation oncologist at the University of Chicago, and since I lived in Chicago, I, I wanted to be treated here. So I came back to U of C. They kind of repeated some of the work that uh, Mayo's had done, and then said, "Yeah, this is this is the deal." Um, so for me, it was pretty straightforward. It was uh, radiation, and then uh, you know a little bit of recovery, uh, surgery, and then uh, and then chemotherapy. And so you know, kind of the for me, the train just kind of took off and I was just on it at that point and, and having an ostomy was just part of the, the, treatment, uh, the treatment process. And, uh, um, you know, like Lois and Ryan, I found, you know, it, uh, over time that it, it ended up not being as, as big a deal as I, as I thought. And uh, so it's been, uh, it's been interesting to the last uh, eight years or so, um, you know, live with that and find that, uh, you know, life does go on. So that's Very my good. story. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Chris. Before we, we started today, Chris and I were talking, and, and he asked me, is it easier for someone who is 50 years old having ostomy surgery versus someone who, who is 18? And I don't know if anyone can answer that, but all three of our, our speakers today on the panel have a journey, and they have a story, and each one of them is equally as important. So thank you so much for joining us today. So I'm going to have a few questions that I'll pose to the panel. As I said, we will open it up um, and allow you to ask some questions as well, as I'm sure you will have some. But like I said earlier, World Ostomy Day is all about bringing awareness to the global community. Um, and there's so many people who have misconceptions about living with an ostomy. So Lois, you were diagnosed when you were fairly young. You had your ostomy surgery. It's just thinking back to that time, what are three misconceptions that uh, you think people have about ostomy surgery, and how would you respond to them about that? Okay. For me personally, I was worried, would I like myself? Who, who would I be? Would I like this person after this surgery? I also thought everybody would know and they would be thinking, oh, oh, poor dear, she has the bag. And I, I also, I, I just didn't know how I, would, how I would function in life. And I, today I realize I'm the same person, except that I'm healthy. I like myself. I didn't like what Crohn's disease was doing to my body, and therefore I didn't really like myself. I was ashamed. I, I thought, especially because of the bowel incontinence, that if you knew my secret, you couldn't possibly like me because I didn't like me. And after my ostomy surgery, I was, I was healthy, I was me, and uh, I also wondered, would I be able to do anything? Would I just be sort of on the sidelines of life? And I realized I had all of this energy. I was not sick. My body was not being burdened with a colon that I'm sure had claw marks attached to it because I didn't want to let it go. <laughs> um, and, and yet I had all of this energy once I said, OK, I'm ready to get over it. So those were the, the misconceptions that I had. Um, about ostomy surgery. I, I, I actually had a few more, but we'll <laughs> Well, and as you're sharing your story, Lois, I, I sit here and, and I see both Ryan and Chris shaking their head in, in mm -hmm. agreement. Um, so Ryan, you as well were fairly young when you mm -hmm. had your surgery. What, what three things would you wish you had known before you had your surgery? Um, I think, 
Yeah, I think just knowing that the quality of life uh, was it was the biggest factor. Knowing that so much of my time was also just like spent in the bathroom and doctor's offices or sick and missing out on some fun activities along the way. Knowing that you know it wasn't the end all be all. You know, having the surgery would be a very very positive thing for me uh, was I guess one misconception or thing that I you know was. You know, I, I couldn't have had it sooner. I didn't know about it until, you know, it was time to have the surgery or too late. But I definitely am, am pretty proactive in the community about talking with patients or, or peers that, you know, may be facing surgery and, and kind of talking to them about, you know, how, how it's affected my life. Obviously, for all of us and every single person, that's a decision that they have to come to, you know, on their own terms and their own way. But uh, the more we can kind of educate and I can educate people that, you know, I'm, I'm here, I'm healthier than ever and more active and it, and it is a, a blessing in disguise that you can finally be, or for me at least be, you know, finally who I wanted to be and able to be uh, active and, you know, yeah. Perfect. And, and it's panels like we're having today and being able to share this mm -hmm. um, with our global community that are going to do exactly what you're saying and, and help those people who are going to have ostomy mm -hmm. surgery. Um, and so, um, Chris, Having had your ostomy a little early or later in life, rather than at 18 years old, um, what was the, probably the biggest obstacle you had to overcome? I, I think trying to understand what you can and can't do. And I think uh, for me, initially, I assumed the list of the things you can't do was probably pretty long. Um, at the time, uh, part of my job was I, I had responsibilities for some operations outside the U.S. And so thinking of getting on a plane and going to Shanghai with an ostomy, I thought, well, that's, you know, done. I won't be able to do to do that. Um, a lot of the physical things that I like to do. So it, it took a little while to kind of understand that those things are possible. You have to be thoughtful about it. There's a lot of, you know, kind of planning that has to go into it. And, uh, you know, you have to, you know, think about a lot of things that you don't, uh, that I didn't have to before, um, even just leaving the house for the day. You know, do you have uh, supplies with you? Um, are you prepared for sort of any eventuality? But, but once I work through that, um, you know, then I realized it's, uh, you know, it's a little bit different, but, uh, but the list of things I could still do was, um, you know, was essentially all the things I could do before. It just took a while to get to that point. All right. I love how you say you just need to, you just need to think about it, but it sure hasn't stopped you. And running a, um, an Ironman triathlon, obviously having an ostomy hasn't stopped you from doing anything. Um, so Lois, there's, um, with your ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, inflammatory bowel disease, um, I'm not sure if the, the audience knows that over 1.4 million people um, actually do live with ulcerative colitis and, and Crohn's disease, and over three quarters of a million people have an ostomy um, because of the disease. Um, so you have a great amount of passion about bringing awareness and dispelling the myths and fears about ostomy surgery. So I know that you created what they call the IBD and ostomy awareness ribbon. Could you tell us a little bit about that and the impact that that has had on the community? Sure, I'd be glad to. And I also want uh, to let everybody know that, that Hollister got behind the ribbon. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> you can have a lot of fun, a lot of jokes with. You've got to have a sense of humor. Mm, absolutely. Uh, you know, I um, after after uh, my ostomy surgery. I realized that there was just, these are uh, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis and ostomy surgery, we don't want to talk about them because they're diseases that affect our digestive system. And what does our digestive system do? What do we all do that we would prefer not to talk about and think we do? We poop. And, um, and of course, ostomy surgery, the, 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 the stigma and the taboo, and we don't want to talk about it. And, and it's all kept behind a locked bathroom door. And so one day I was thinking, you know, this was when the ribbon craze was, was out there and it still is, why don't we have a ribbon that signifies what we have gone through? And I realized the, the ribbon had to be brown. There was no other color, and I apologize for those who have had urostomies. <laughs> But you know, the overwhelming color had to, be, had to be brown, and I was trying to think, what, what could we call it? And I was sitting in my, my living room one day, and all of a sudden, the light bulb went off in my head, and the tagline is, was, it's more than a ribbon, it's a movement. <laughs> 
<laughs> and if you're wearing a brown ribbon, people come up to you. At least that this is what the experience that I have had. I had. I was in airports, and people would say, "What's that brown ribbon?" You know, what, what, I've never seen a brown ribbon. I mean, we all know the pink ribbon, and it was a way that I could I could educate people about Crohn's disease or, or um, ulcerative colitis, and especially about ostomy surgery. And it, it was amazing. Um, this little ribbon took off. I, I sent it all over the world. Uh, Australia, I now have somebody that I know in Australia. And if I ever decide to move to Australia, he can build me a house. <laughs> <laughs> and it, I, I got so many um, uh, uh, notifications from people. Thank you so much. Uh, it, it's a way of we can come out in the open and we can utilize it as a way to educate people. And especially for ostomy surgery because everybody thinks it's, it's horrible and it's terrible. And after talking with me, they realized, no, it's really, for me, it was a lifesaver. For so many people, it was a lifesaver. So it was really a way for me to, to have fun with something and also to be proactive. And it was my way of, of educating people that I came in contact with. Well, thank you, and, and I do have to share a story with you. So um, I understand Hollister w did get behind you on this um, as well, and one of our associates was wearing the ribbon in an airport, and someone came up to her and asked her about the ribbon, and that person actually had ulcerative colitis disease, and so had the ribbon sent to her, so it was all about awareness. So you definitely have made an impact, and thank you. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that with me. And I know that I've said it numerous times as well, is it everyone on the panel's done amazing things, but I, I sit here beside Chris and we talk about him um, doing an Ironman triathlon. So I just have to ask out there in the crowd, how many of you have done an Ironman triathlon? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't no see fact. any. <laughs> so what an amazing accomplishment. Congratulations. Um, um, so obviously, Running, swimming, and biking is, is obviously a lifelong hobby of yours. And can you just share what you've learned about participating in such activities with your ostomy? Um, well, yeah, from a practical standpoint, uh, you know, just sort of, um, you know, how to prepare to be able to, to be out on a bike ride and, or on a long run and, you know, deal with the possibility that you might have to change out, you know, your uh, complete appliance and just kind of getting comfortable with being able to do that on the side of the road. Um, and uh, also my training partner's getting comfortable with me doing that on the side of the road. <laughs> Actually, it is a bit of a traffic stopper if you don't go, you know, a little bit off. Um, but, uh, but I have to say that really didn't happen very much. I mean, I've, I use, not to plug Hollister, but I use Hollister products and they really did a great job for me through, uh, through all that training and have done a, been very reliable, which is really, was really important. But I will say the thing that I, that I probably really learned that I would never have guessed would have come in so handy is in a, in a triathlon, you do three events. You know, you, you swim, you bike, and you run. And in between them, there's a little bit of a transition. And you, you start each one of those legs. You know, you're excited for the swim. And by the end of it, in the Ironman, it's a 2.4-mile swim. At the end of the 2.4 miles, you're like, I, I just want to get out of the water. I'm tired of swimming. And then you have a little transition. You get your bike stuff on. You get on the bike. After 112 miles, you're like, I hate that bike. I just want to get off of it. And then, you know, you put your running stuff on and go out for a marathon. And what hit me really for, uh, for cancer treatment is it's, it is kind of like a triathlon, at least a lot of treatments are in mine was, which is three phases, radiation, surgery, chemotherapy. And in between, you get a little bit of a break between this transition that you have between the three stages. And that sort of mental model of understanding that you start one of the phases, radiation, you're kind of excited. You know, 28 days later, you know, you're tired of going there every day and, and having radiation, but then it's done. You have a little bit of a break. Now you're getting geared up for the surgery. You have that. And at the end of it, you're ready to be done with that. And then you start the next one, chemotherapy. So I guess the thing that I wouldn't have expected would translate was just that idea of you can have these sort of multiple phases in your treatment and you have the ups and downs, you know, through those. And it was very helpful to kind of fall back on that 
Oh, I remember what this feels like. This is halfway through this part and it's tough here. You just have to get through it and then you get your little break and you start the next thing. And that was a surprising you know, thing that I learned and found was very applicable. What a great analogy, I love it. And what I also love is that I think you're a huge role model for people who, who've had ostomy surgery and, and you're probably not encouraging every person who has had ostomy to get out and run an Ironman triathlon, <laughs> but it does let people know that yeah, I can go for a run yeah, I can go for a swim, mm -hmm. and yeah, I can go for a bike ride. Mm -hmm. So thank you for all that you do. Sure. But any true athlete has to fuel their body with food. <laughs> um, and so by a show of hands, how many people love food? <laughs> and how many people love to cook, though? No, less. People yeah. love to be cooked for, I think. Um, so, so actually, Ryan, I would love to just to really truly hear more about your story about food and your path for food, sure. particularly why you find it so important um, to deal with food uh, um, having had an ostomy. For sure. Um, I mean, I've always loved food. My background, like you briefly talked about, was actually social work. I worked uh, in the juvenile jail for a number of years. I did child abuse and neglect investigations for DCFS for about 10 years. So cooking was, for me at that time, always something that was a stress reliever, a creative outlet after a long day at work. Uh, and over the years, just kind of honed my skills. I'm completely self-taught and my business partner is self-taught and we just, uh, we've been cooking for about 10 to 15 years for ourselves and for friends and, and decided to start a business with a very catchy, quirky name. Um, <laughs> but with my health, it was always something that I was very conscious of, what I was putting in my body, what I was eating, because it's, it's a direct correlation to how you feel, energy-wise, mentally. Uh, so after the ostomy, um, it actually opened up more possibilities to what I could eat before surgery. Every little thing would affect me. I, I was already in the bathroom a lot, but even simple foods or fried food or anything would, you know, uh, make the symptoms worse. So once I had the ostomy surgery, I actually could eat a lot more and, and try more things and, and kind of experiment more in the kitchen and uh, kind of expand my palate. But also at the same time, I, I was more conscious than ever of what I was eating um, because of having you know a short gut. Now I'm, I'm, I found myself getting dehydrated a lot and quickly after the surgery, just not knowing um, you know how to kind of maintain my weight and my energy level. So it made it more important to put like healthy foods in my body, and that easily transitioned with my uh, private dining business to educate people on healthy eating habits. Uh, whether it's for uh, a one-time event or a cooking class, whether you have IBD symptoms or you don't, food affects all of us, affects our GI system, affects our mood, our energy. Uh, so it, was, uh, it, it seemed just to go hand in hand with uh, my, my background, my professional career, and then my, you know, my personal experience with the disease and having an ostomy. Perfect, and when I think everybody's all about healthy habits with eating, mm -hmm. so, so Ostomy or no ostomy, sure. I think the, the new dude food's doing the right thing. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to ask, um, so Chris, a little bit, I know you've done a, a fair amount of volunteering with a, a group called Imerman's Angels. Mm -hmm. And from what you've told me, it's a, a group that matches new cancer patients with cancer survivors. Um, and these people have either just found out they're having ostomy surgery or they've just had ostomy surgery. So I just maybe if you could share with how do you talk to people about having an ostomy? And when do you share that information with them? Well, in the, in the context of the Women's Angels organization, um, it's, uh, it's, it's more about them being able to ask you questions. And so part of the, the idea is that someone may be, uh, you know, if you, if you have gone through cancer or you're a caregiver who's supported someone going through cancer, you can register with this organization. They uh, have you fill out a pretty detailed questionnaire. They put you into a database. And then when someone who is newly diagnosed or someone who's going to support someone who's newly diagnosed calls in, they try and match you up with someone who has similar experiences. And so in that context, your job really is to, you know, listen mainly and, and try and do the, resist doing the thing that, that I think a lot of people do and you guys have probably experienced before is sometimes you get in a conversation with someone and you're, you're interested in, you know, kind of talking to them about your fears and your questions. And sometimes it's, it's hard for that person not to share a lot of their experience with you. And the Immermans is, is, is very much about just listening to what that person wants to ask you and then trying to 
to share that. So that in that context, it's pretty easy because they're asking you things that are most important to them. They're talking about the things that they fear the most, and uh, and so you let them guide the conversation. I will say in general, and, and you know, hearing uh, you know Ryan and Lois, I you know I, I am not very uh, out there in terms of sharing my story or, or talking with people. And you know I'm, I'm uh, you know it particularly it's inspiring to hear the work that you've done. I've done some of it, but I tend to be maybe a little more a little less out there, a little less likely to kind of share my story. Happy to do so when people ask, but. Uh, but not as uh, um, you know, not, not as aggressive in uh, in doing that. So, uh, so I, that's I maybe need to step up my game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I think everyone's on, on their journey, and you all are making an impact in your own unique and individual ways, and doing it the way that you're most comfortable with. So, so thank you for sharing sure. that that with us as well, um, Ryan. I know you do as well. I mean, the volunteer work that all of you do is amazing. But I know that you also have the opportunity to go to Camp Oasis, um, and I know the impact that camp can have on kids. But can you share a story with me about the impact that that camp has had on you. Sure. Uh, I mean, I didn't have anything like that when I was newly diagnosed or young. I think I, my first year at camp, I was in my late twenties as a counselor. Um, and I, so for me, just having a community uh, of other counselors and peers, let alone the kids, uh, was super inspiring and, and a great support for me because Growing up, I didn't, outside of the doctor's office, I didn't have anybody or knew anyone with it, uh, or with Crohn's or colitis, or especially with an ostomy. Um, so to see kids much younger than me dealing with the disease or having surgeries and ostomies and thriving, and here I am, you know, 20 something years older than them, and, you know, it was inspiring for me to be able to um, kind of gain that confidence even from them you know, not, again, not having kind of any personal connections to it. And so immediately after that first year, I had formed a, a good relationship with a, a counselor and we came back to the city and formed a support group that we ran uh, through the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation for about six years, just because we saw the need and, and it was so inspiring being at that camp that I didn't want that magical week to end. I wanted to take that back and, and kind of share that with other people in the community. So like I said, I, I don't think I missed a year. It's, this year was my 10th year. Um, it's moved, it was up near Green Bay for the first five years. So it was like a five, six hour drive for a long time. And now it's a much closer drive, but it's still one of the most you know special weeks of my life. I, I don't wanna, I take work, I've taken work off over the years to do it. It's something that's very special and um, not only for the kids, but also what I can get out of it as well. Yeah. Yeah, and I absolutely loved how you said, you know, camp is one week, mm -hmm. but you've actually done things beyond to make camp live the entire year um, because camp is so important to those kids and it really does become part of the community. So it's wonderful what you're doing. Thank you. Um, and Lois, Lois, uh, you, you volunteer a ton. I can't even imagine being on Sally, Jesse, Raphael. Um, but you have a zest for life, and, and you truly do have an I can do it attitude. You, you can see that in everything that you're saying. So, what inspires you the most, and what gives you the most confidence in your life while living with the ostomy? Knowing that I have incredible freedom. I mean, as I said before, when I had active Crohn's, I was basically hiding in a bathroom. I, w I was terrified to go anywhere. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't even listen to you as you were talking because I was so gut-focused, wondering, am I going to have to suddenly run off and go to the bathroom and hopefully find it in time and not have an accident? And what would you be thinking of me? And after my ostomy surgery, I didn't have to do that anymore. And uh, it's just the amazing sense of freedom that I have. And I also know that, um, Hollister, you have a product that we can, all, we can trust. And that gives me the confidence. Yes, uh, I, you will have accidents. I've had a few accidents, but everybody has accidents. And I learned how to deal with them and to go on. And in fact, not that long ago, I was at a, um, an event for my high school. And I felt something that didn't feel right. And I went to the bathroom and, oh my gosh. And you know, I dealt with it, went back, nobody knew. And just knowing that the products that I'm using enable me 
to feel confident and secure, and I can go out there and I can live my life and hopefully educate people if, if it happens, to if the opportunity arises. And I think that's the best way that I can let people know that you don't have to be afraid of ostomy surgery, is by walking the talk and showing people that, hey, you know, if I can do it, so can you. And it's not the most horrible thing in the world. And I, I feel so, um, I feel so bad when people, when I hear people say that they would rather die than have an ostomy. And I, I understand where they're coming from because to me it was a very frightening prospect. I really didn't even know what ostomy surgery entailed. I just knew from a very early age this was the surgery you wanted to avoid at all costs. And by sharing my experience, I can show people that that, that thinking is incorrect. And so what, again, it inspires me that, that if I, in my own way, if I can show people they don't have to be afraid of this surgery, uh, and that I have the confidence because I'm wearing products that allow me to do that, and it just, become, it just becomes a wonderful circle that just keeps going. Perfect. You know, and your confidence does show for sure. And, and Chris was saying he was talking to someone on a phone earlier who um, had ostomy surgery and hasn't been out of his home in an entire year. And it's today's panel and discussion that's going to give that person some confidence to maybe get out. So all of your stories are definitely helping people everywhere. Um, so this is going to be now a question that I'd love to pose to all of you. Um, but what do you feel is the most important thing um, to share about your story of living with an ostomy for World Ostomy Day? So what's the one World Ostomy Day quote you would have? Go ahead. You go ready. <laughs> <laughs> I, will, I will share with uh, something a nurse said to me uh, when I had my surgery. She said... You can do anything that you want after ostomy surgery. You can do anything that you did before, you will be able to do after. She said the biggest drawback to you being having a successful, healthy life will be that thing that's between your ears, your brain, and how you choose to see your ostomy surgery. Do you choose to see it as awful, or do you see it as giving you a chance to live a healthy life? And that would be my one takeaway, is it's your thoughts, and they can influence so much in your life. If, you're, if you have a positive attitude about it, it will be incredible. Thank you. Yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. Um, I think, I guess my quote has been said a couple of times, is just that not to let the disease or having an ostomy define you. Um, but the biggest thing, yeah, the biggest thing is mentally, yeah, it's a, it's a very physical change. There's a lot of physical um, things you have to get through in surgery and, and recovery and side effects and medicines, but the biggest factor of, uh, I think, a successful recovery and a su successful life is your attitude. And I, I think for me, you know, it's, it's changed my life and my outlook. You know, if I can go through these surgeries and go through this horrible disease and come out better for it, uh, it, it makes everything else in life a little easier to deal with. You know, bad traffic, no big deal. Like, there's a lot of things that, <laughs> that every, everyday people that, you know, get stressed out about and... It just it doesn't really phase me. Not that I it doesn't matter to me, but I've just dealt with so much worse. I think that it's just made me really prioritize where to put my energy. And so, knowing that you can overcome illness and surgeries and still have a very very productive life uh, is is the the biggest thing that I've taken from it, and that drives me every day. Great, thank you. I, I think you guys both said that really well, so I don't, uh, I don't have a lot to add other than just, I guess, that idea that it, it really isn't that big a deal. It's as big a deal as you, mm -hmm. you know, as you make it. Um, it's a change, but, you know, so is, you know, if you end up having to wear glasses, okay, you have to wear glasses. And some people, you know, oh, geez, that's a, that's a big deal, but pretty soon you get used to it, and it's just the way you, 
you are. Well, I definitely hear a ton of positivity, um, and and like you said, it's what what it's what you're thinking and and how you're how you're processing it, um, and it's the positivity that I, I continually um, is what really touches my heart. Um, so um, I'd like to actually open it up to see if anyone here has any questions um, for our panel. Oh, here we have one from Brock. Thanks, Karen. Thanks, everybody, and I want to thank the panel for being here today. Uh, for those of you who do know me or don't know me, I've actually had an ostomy myself for almost 20 years uh, as a result of uh, being born with spina bifida. So um, here at Hollister, peristomal skin health is actually at the forefront of what we're doing as an organization, both through education and new product development. So I just wanted to ask the panel maybe what uh, having healthy peristomal skin means to you and uh, how you work to both check and maintain that throughout your, uh, your journey. Does anyone want to take that? Yeah, I mean, I, I've also had it about 20 years, and I don't really, I don't know, I found products that work for me and really stuck with them. I haven't really changed things over the years. I probably could. I'm sure there's better technology and better things and products I could be using, but I'm just comfortable with what I use. As far as just, you know, my hygiene and cleansing routine, um, I'm really active, I'm in the gym a lot, I'm, I'm moving around a lot, so I, I change my bag often, I have a one-piece system, um, so I'm, I'm constantly kind of checking on the skin and usually in the shower, just take some time to thoroughly clean, check it out, and kind of just let, let things kind of air out and cool out, but I don't really, outside of uh, the products I use, I don't kind of have any special tricks or any special kind of cleaning products I use, I just, kind of do my daily routine and so far so good. Um, I had a WOC nurse say to me, you've got to take care of your peristomal skin. If you take care of it, it will take care of you. And so I've just followed that advice. And if I sense any even minor itching or uh, discomfort, I just changed my pouching system and put on a new one. I'm not going to get extra points to try to go one extra day. <laughs> and, and when I'm talking to uh, somebody who's newly diagnosed, that's what I stress. And I find that if I make sure that that peristomal skin is healthy, uh, then I don't, uh, I don't have any issues with skin breakdown. I, I did develop a, an allergy or a, um, a reaction to the dye in a tan collar, so now I have to use a wafer that has no dyes in it. But other than that, um, if, if I take care of my peristomal skin, it will take care of me. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I've, I've been lucky historically. Um, I, I've been amazed at how your skin changes, like around the, the stoma. It's interesting to me how the skin, you know, I don't know what the process is, but it begins to look different, behave different, tougher. It's it's uh, interesting. I will say it's it's funny that you bring it up because uh, it is kind of becoming an issue for me. I uh, unfortunately had a relapse and have am back on chemotherapy that is breaking down my my skin, um, and in addition to doing it on my nose, it's beginning to kind of get after the skin in that area as well. So uh, I may uh, I may be circling back with your R and D guys to <laughs> what I do about that. But uh, but yeah, my my skin is is not as healthy as it was all over the place, and and that's a spot that I'm beginning to notice some problems that I've never experienced before. So thank you for sharing your experience. Mm -hmm. Andy. So uh, Ryan and Lois, you both mentioned that after surgery, your life was better than before in dealing with what you were dealing with. How long did that take until that hit you and you realized that this is actually an improvement? You want to go first? Sure. Uh, I noticed the difference three days after my surgery. It was that fast. I mean, I, I was still hurting. I, I, as I said to my dad right after surgery, I feel as if I've been hit by a Mack truck. He backed up and did it again. Uh, but three days later, my body knew, felt the difference. It didn't have this disease, non-functioning colon, weighing it down. So for me, it was that fast, three days. 
Yeah, mine was very fast also. While I was still recovering in the hospital, they had weaned me off a lot of the steroids I was on. So even just having that out of my system uh, and my colon out out of me, I, I felt a lot better before I even left the hospital. Um, I think to, uh, to understand it all and to really get under control, it probably took months though, even after my recovery more so because all of a sudden I had all this energy and was so excited, I just was out there just doing everything and making myself dehydrated and not <laughs> listening to my body because all of a sudden for the first time ever, I had you know I had the opportunity to do things that I hadn't been able to do for a long time. Um, but once I kind of put myself in check and kind of listened to my body and made sure to stay hydrated and eat a little better, um, yeah, it's been kind of nonstop positives ever since. Thank you so much for sharing your story. I'm a WOC nurse, and um, I'm curious uh, specifically to Ryan and um, Lois, because you were so young when you had your ostomy, um, how did you share your um, your ostomy surgery with your peers or when you were uh, dating without getting too personal? But <laughs> um, I think that's a challenge. I mean, it's still, I mean, I share my story all the time when, I, when I'm meeting someone new or not like, hey, you know, every single person I meet off the street, <laughs> but in, in uh, yeah, I mean, I guess in friendships and in, in dating relationships, uh, I just, I, I kind of just let it happen naturally. It wasn't something that, again, it, I didn't let it define me, so it wasn't anything that was a really a big deal to me. And so I kind of took that attitude in friendships or in relationships that, when it came out, it came out, and if that person was okay with it, great, and if they weren't, then they weren't a, a, someone that I needed to be in, in my life or a relationship with. If they weren't seeing me who I really was and were looking down at me or judging me for scars or an ostomy, then that wasn't something that I wanted to kind of associate myself with. Um, so I think in, in younger, you know, I, I had friends. My 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 close peer group knew how sick I was. They were they saw they were around me all the time. And as I after I had the surgery and and kind of reconnected with friends and was more social and 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 kind of able to be who I wanted to be. Um, I remember it was years ago. I was pl I was playing on a softball team and. I don't, I don't know. I, I don't think I was doing anything, anything special, but after the game, changed out of my jersey into a, a shirt to go out to like a bar or something, and, and a, a teammate noticed my ostomy, like, wait, like, what is that? And I, I told them, and they were, if anything, they were like blown away that I out hustled, or like, they're like, I had no idea, like, you've been doing all these things all this time, and I never knew. And, 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 it inspired me to like, yeah, this is this this motivates me because I don't let it define me. But at the same time, you know, you, you can't see what people unless you're shirtless or you can't see, you know, what people have or been through. Uh, so I, I think if anything, when people do find out about it, uh, it's, it's, it's generally been very positive. I actually have never had I've never had a negative reaction from someone, you know, finding it out you know, if I have an ostomy or surgery. So, yeah. For me, I took my cue from some friends wanted to know more information. Some friends were not comfortable knowing a lot of information. They were just happy that I was healthy. Like Ryan, you know, I, we don't go out and, oh, want to see my ostomy? <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what a stoma is? Let me tell you. As far as, so, so depending on how much information friends were comfortable with that I, I sort of took my cues from them. As far as intimacy, I have one story that I, I knew I had met this person and we could see where the, the direction was going. And I let him know that I had been sick, that I had Crohn's disease, that I had had surgery, that I was healthy. I told him what, what the surgery was and I said, you know, is this going to bother you? And he looked at me and he said, I don't care. He said, it doesn't change who you are as a person. He said, you won't get rid of me that easily. <laughs> he was also an alcoholic. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, we, we, he, was, he, was, he was in recovery, we lived together. 
and he was very supportive. It, it was not an issue. The few times that I had a leak, uh, it, it, it was no big deal. And then I did have another uh, incident where I, I had given this person uh, a tape to watch when I was on local television in, in Seattle. And uh, he came to pick me up a few days later, and I could see, I, I already could tell uh, uh, that something wasn't right. He, he didn't even want to sit next to me at dinner, and there was very little conversation. And so I said to him, well, what did you think of the tape? And he said, he made some sort of a comment as he's backing away from me. Mm -hmm. And I never saw him again. And I was secure enough in myself as who I was as a person. I realized this was an issue for him. Uh, he couldn't handle it, but that didn't affect me because I was okay with me. And like you, uh, why would you want to have someone in your life who, uh, I, I mean, I, I can't, my stoma and I are intimately connected here. <laughs> we have this relationship. You, you, you'd have to take the whole package. And I think we all have something in someone else that we can't handle. And I, know that, I knew that those were his issues, and I was OK with it. And so for me, it really has not been an issue intimacy-wise. And uh, again, I take my cues from people. And if they are interested, I will share information. And I, that's how I deal with it. Thank you. Well, thank you to the panel for answering the audience's questions. Um, I personally would like to thank the organizing committee for Hollister World Ostomy Day for allowing me to share the stage with the three of you. Um, you are amazing people. You're amazing and doing amazing things to really um, help our community be much better. And, and that's just much better overall, but you're also sharing your story and bringing that global awareness about living life with an ostomy, with your inspirations, your aspirations, and everything that you're doing in life. So thank you so much for sharing and being part of our panel today. Sure, thank you.